what is a miniature painting? Um, like the word says, they're not always really, really small, actually. It's quite misleading. Um, they can be quite large. This miniature painting is about, is at least 18 inches wide, so let, you can get a sense of what some of these works can be. Um, the painting style was very flat, not three-dimensional. It was meant to not have perspective. However, it was meant to have a lot of complex stories being told. For example, in this painting, you can see Raja Rinder Singh on uh, an elephant, and there's attendants flanking him, there's, there's something going on in the background, there's architectural detail, there's stuff happening in the front, there's this guy looking up. So there's a lot going on in the painting. However, if someone sees it for the very first time, they might just get lost and kind of faded by the detail, and you might not see anything because there's so much going on. So there was high amounts of complex stories being told in these paintings. There could have been a character in the same story displayed at different points in the same painting, and that's how the story was told. For Sikh miniatures specifically, um, they were created from the late 18th century to the early 20th century from what I have found out. Um, a lot of research still needs to be done in this area. And the reason they're created in this time, can anybody take a guess why during this time? I mentioned it before too. Does anybody remember what period Maharaj Ranjit Singh was around? So the Sikh Empire came around around about 1801. So at the end of the 18th century, that's when Sikhs were coming into a lot more power. Um, they had influence and they wanted to record some of this influence and power they're exercising through paintings because guess what? They did not have iPhones. Um, also, among Sikh miniatures, some of the most common themes were royal and religious. By royal, I mean, um, you know, just paintings depicting court life. So first, the first category was the gurus. So the ten, all ten gurus were depicted in the Sikh miniatures, most often as kings of kings. So here you can see a miniature painting uh, dating to about 1830 of Guru Gobind Singh Ji on horseback. What his, this portrait resembles is, you know, this princely equestrian portrait that was done of Mughal princes and of kings. But the gurus were painted in this way to show them as kings of kings. And to my surprise, um, most of these paintings were also, most of these paintings were not just commissioned by Sikh patrons. They were also commissioned by non-Sikh patrons. Um, however, the painters most often were non-Sikhs and were also male. There was, I don't think there were many female painters at the time. The second major category of Sikh miniatures you'll find is the Janamsakis. Even at the Asian Art Museum here in San Francisco, there, were, uh, there was a huge, there's about, I think there were about eight Janamsakis on display last year uh, in the Sikh gallery. And this Janamsaki specifically, can anybody tell me which Janamsaki this is? Just take a guess. Um, it has to do something with the Makkah. With, with Nanak is sleeping with his feet towards Kaaba. Can anybody see the yellow halo around Nanak? Is it visible? So in this painting, the painter has indicated Nanak with a yellow halo around him. So in most of the Janam Sakis, you'll find uh, Nanak with, Guru Nanak with a uh, halo. And you can see the holy man trying to scold Nanak about sleeping with his feet towards Kaaba. And likewise with Janam Sakis, the painters were non sikh and the patrons were six and non sikh um, If you're curious to know how we know that, how do we know that the patrons were non sikh is because you can find some of the Janam Sakis that belong to the Kashmiri region where most of the patrons were not sikh uh, Sikhs were mostly living in the Punjab plains and then the Kangra region, which Deep was mentioning earlier, which was the Pahari region. The third major category of Sikh miniatures is, uh, you know, miniatures documenting the life of the Sikh royals. Um, in this, in the painting on the left, you can see Ranjit Singh meeting with um, one of the members of his court, Dhan Singh, and he's sitting with all the other people who are part of his family and part of his co court. The two people behind him are his sons. And the painting on the right, that's Ranjit Singh seated in what actually is a European chair, so there's some influence coming into miniature paintings. And he's sitting with Hira Singh, who is the son of uh, Yan Singh. So there's an interesting story there where Hira Singh was actually one of, they say it's one of his favorite people because he was probably one of the only guys who was allowed to sit in his presence, in his court. 
With these paintings, what's significant to know is that, um, you know, when you have a lot of power and you have money and you have influence, you want to find a way to kind of tell other people about it. Uh, it's possible Ranjit Singh did not commission these paintings. It's probably highly possible, but it's possible someone who really liked him and wanted to get in his favor commissioned this painting on the left and gave it to him as a gift. And again, because they could not just take photographs of what was happening in court life all the time. So these are the three major categories that um, exist in Sikh miniatures. And personally for me, I don't know, have any of you even heard of the term Sikh miniature before? No. Deep you should answer, at least probably has. Um, I hadn't heard of this term either. I was actually mind boggled when I figured that there's actually a documented style that's labeled sick painting, sick miniature painting. Um, I, I was really, really happy because I was pursuing the style and I didn't even know it. Um, so it's really significant for the work I do as an artist. To tell you a little bit about who the painters were who were creating these paintings, we know that most of them were not sick. Um, so there was probably a, you know, uh, an exchange of ideas. It's possible the patron was sick and the painter was not. So I, I always wonder how they would have interacted. Did they have influence on each other? Did the painter's Pahari style have an influence on a Raja, Sikh Raja living in Punjab? Did his aesthetic have an influence on a painter that was from you know, the Rajasthan region? So that's one question I always ask. But since I'm a miniature painter who lives today, um, there's also a very strong contrast between who I am and who these miniature painters were. For example, um, no, these miniature painters were not just artists. So if you know anything about artists, you know, we always think, okay, an artist comes up with a composition, then they lay color, and then they beautify the painting, and then they're done with it. That's what I would think of when I think of how an artist creates their work. Uh, with, these, with these miniature painters, they were craftsmen as well. So they not only had to create the composition and color it in and figure out you know, what they were going to do with the painting, but they also had to figure out a way to produce the paper they were using. They had to make the brushes. They had to grind the pigments. They had to prepare the pigments in order to color with them. So they had to know, have knowledge of everything. They were not just going to be concerned with the painting. They were going to be concerned with the materials and the methodology. And this is what's going to be lost, probably, um, because it's really difficult to be able to do all those things and be an artist. And that brings, to my, that brings me to my second point, is that these painters were living a lifestyle of the miniature painter. So, you know, for my journey has been that I was a biologist, I was in public health, and I switched to art about five years ago. And um, when I switched, I had the option to do art part-time, I had the option to devote my entire time to being an artist. But these painters were probably starting out as a miniature painter at, the age, at a very young age, maybe in their teenage years, when they would start out with grinding pigments. And if you've, I don't know if you've ever seen how pigments are made from stone, but if you just imagine a rock, and you start grinding a rock, and you make it into a powder, that's what I mean by grinding pigments. So if you were just an entry level skill if you were just an entry level person, you were just doing that for four or five months. Um, I don't have the patience to do that, and I don't have to do that, thankfully, today, because I can just pick up at any level of skill that I have and, or don't have, and I can learn it. But at that time, they had to start off really at a lower level and graduate to every single skill. So maybe after grinding pigments, they would do the borders on the paintings. Maybe after that, they would draw the animals. Maybe after that, they would do the leaves and then do the figures. So, Eventually, it started off with a junior painter, went to a senior painter, craftsman, and then ended up at a master painter level when you had your own workshop. Thankfully, I don't have to do that. So that's one strong contrast between who the miniature painters were uh, at that time and who I am today. But also that speaks to some of the, um, some of the system of you know, this lifestyle of devoting yourself to a craft that kind of uh, we lost when, especially when the British came over, so we lost that. Lastly, on this slide, uh, the point about a group versus individuality. So a lot of people say that miniature painting is, you know, copying of figures, you, you copy one figure and you do the, and you know, nobody's coming up with new compositions. The fact of the matter is that in miniature painting, that's what you have to preserve. 
So if a guler, which is one form of pahari painting, if a guler um, deer looks a certain way, the guler deer has to look that way even today. And that's what it's looked um, you know, since the 18th century. If a guler face looks a certain way, and guler is usually the style that I associate with sick, pin, sick painting, the, the face has to look the same way. So me as an artist, I can change the face today because I'm not part of a uh, workshop, but they did not do this. They actually, the preservation of the forms was very important. Hence, you question about the individuality of the artist. You don't find many names on miniature paintings, and I think this is the reason why, because the painting probably went through at least five people, or maybe even more, and they did different stages of the same painting. Um, the painting we saw earlier of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Hira Singh, I, I, I'm feeling it might have been done by many people, um, and whose names would you put on there? But then that's why miniature paintings belong to certain workshops, um, and not always an individual artist, unless they're well documented and we know about them. So for me, that's really difficult to digest because you know here I am, an artist living in San Francisco, competing other art other artists also who are you know expressing original individual work. So I definitely take my own contemporary take on miniature painting, but at the same time, the masters I learned from have taught me to do the Galer deer a certain way, and that's what they test me on. So this is a struggle I have personally about this point, and we'll see where where, where that goes for me. Okay, so this will get a little, it might get crazy a little bit, but I'll, I just want to share with you guys why these materials and methods are going to die off and what was so difficult about them and what is so difficult about them. The really amazing thing is that the way a miniature painter would have probably mixed, say, the black pigment um, two centuries ago is the way I mix my black pigment in my studio. And to me, that just, that's amazing because um, the knowledge that was required to produce that black pigment and then to mix it and then to lay it on paper has been preserved. However, I don't know many miniature painters practicing in that form, at least none here. Uh, nobody's even heard of miniature painting in North America, so uh, we'll see where that goes. But just to tell you a little bit about the materials and methods that are associated with creating these uh, pieces of art, Paper, which is called Wesley. Um, Wesley is the paper that we use to paint on, and that's the paper that was used earlier as well. Wesley was either coming from families of paper makers. So for example, I get my paper from a family in Jaipur, who are the grandsons of paper makers. The pigments came from minerals, vegetable, or the organic pigments. So if you look in the corner, if you can, someone can read process of making lamp black, the right corner, uh, the right bottom corner, that's me making lamp black in my studio. Uh, so lamp black is a black pigment that we use. Uh, so I can't just go to Michael's, grab a gouache tube or watercolor tube and just lay on the black. I have to make the black pigment. I obviously don't have to do it, but I choose to do it. Um, the black pigment is made by burning oil. Uh, and I think Rahul Deep was referencing to it earlier. The oil is burnt, the, the precipitate is collected um, in a terracotta, a lid over the top of the flame, and that precipitate is then mixed with gum arabic, which is the binding agent, which is the oldest binding agent ever used in painting, um, which is, this is the rougher form of gum arabic and prepared, of course. So that's where, that's a short story of how lamp black is made, and in my opinion, that's the easiest color to make. So you can imagine what other colors require. For example, indigo comes from a plant, and that produces a beautiful blue that's used. And red oxide, which is actually a poisonous powder, is used for um, producing red in these paintings. The brush has an interesting story. So I can't just, I mean, I could use a brush um, from the local art store. But for miniature painting specifically, the squirrel hair brush is used. The squirrel hair usually comes from baby squirrels. They're not harmed in the process, or so I'm told. Um, and this brush has this really interesting curve that, uh, that happens when you dip it in water. The reason the curve is important is because miniature painters were known to be very good at line work. If you look really closely to min at a miniature painter painting, and I really suggest if you do, please take a magnifying glass because that's where the beauty is, um, you'll see that the line work is consistent. So the thickness of the line had to be the same. You couldn't just make the line thicker and thinner in some places. The thickness of the line was the same. And 
In my study uh, and training, that's what I spent the first three days on, just getting the line consistently. So this brush is very valuable. A really interesting point about the brush is that there's superstition among miniature painters that if you've been using your miniature, if you've been using your squirrel hair brush, you don't share it with anybody because your brush gets used to you and it gets used to your ways. And if somebody else is holding it and using it, uh, there's tendency for the brush to go astray or to be misled. So um, I've made the mistake of giving my brush to someone earlier, but I'm never going to get it back because I don't think I'll use it again. Um, last but not the least, burnishing stone is something that you know, it's a very important part of our toolkit. Um, burnishing stone is used to basically rub down the color. So once you color in, say, a triangle and it, it's colored in green, you burnish the area that's colored in because these natural pigments change in structure when they're heated up by rubbing them. So that natural structure has, that structure has to change for these paintings to become um, even more vibrant. And the reason why these paintings from, you know, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries have still lasted is because these pigments are very strong and they don't fade unless they're exposed to UV. So how does this knowledge apply to my work today as, uh, in, as, a, as an artist? I've shared some of this, but most importantly, uh, you know, just researching older Sikh art has informed what type of themes I want to bring out in my work. Um, you can call me, you know, someone who's just obsessing over old stuff because there's many people who are collectors of old stuff. But for me, what's more important is to obsess over the process by which some of these paintings were created because that process requires a certain type of devotion and requires a certain type of discipline. And that devotion is, and discipline is something where um, I, I don't think I can go to a painter and learn. That's something that comes by practicing this art form that's traditional and that has certain principles that binds it. So in my work, um, some of the themes that are very relevant and important to me are identity, displacement, and heritage. Uh, and some of the miniature work I do has to do with these three themes. Identity because I moved to the US about at the age of 11, and I've always struggled with the idea of, you know, am I Punjabi Sikh? Am I just Sikh? Am I Punjabi Indian Sikh? Like, you know, am I an Indian miniature painter? Am I a Sikh miniature painter? Like, what am I? So the questions I ask through my paintings about identity are very important and belonging. Displacement because I've grown up on stories of partition uh, from both sides of my family. And just the idea of movement and migration and how that influences a group of people and what's important to you and what objects you actually hold dear to yourself um, have been some, uh, questions I ask. And then last but not the least, heritage. So for me, for example, preserving you know, the Gurmukhi script is very important because the Gurmukhi script has not been played around with, I think, um, much at all because nobody's actually taking the time in my contemporary life to um, push the script and try to uh, get more out of it. So, and also something like Love Stories of Punjab. The center painting is from, is my depiction of Heed recently. So all these literary works and also Gurbani, a part of heritage that I hold dear to myself, and that's how I display it through my miniature work. And it also finds its way into my Gurmukhi calligraphy, and I don't know why that's not showing up. Um, I'm not sure why that's not showing up. But here the example was basically miniature-inspired um, interpretation of Gurbani. So one of the paintings I did was based on the was based on the bule form of the deer. The deer in Gurbani symbolizes attachment, as far as I've been able to translate to myself or interpret. Um, here, the deer is symbolizing attachment, and so and there as well. And these are both miniature forms that combining with calligraphy um, to produce a meaning that is more visually striking, as well as something that somebody can connect to right away, even if they don't know how to read Gurbani. I can use it. The second example um, of some of the work I do is you know, pushing the boundaries of the script. I've been doing calligraphy of Gurmukhi probably, but the first time when I did it, I was in India, you know, going to school, and they would make you do calligraphy competitions just to motivate you to get you know, better, better handwriting. And that's the first time I ever wrote Gurmukhi out. But my journey with Gurbani started out of fear. Um, why was I writing it out? It was because I was afraid that I was going to forget how to 
read and understand Bhagavan. I was afraid I was going to not be able to, you know, read one tuk and know what it means. And I was really afraid I was going to lose it. I was going to lose that connection because my whole life has been about, you know, putting down roots. Because when you're 11 and you move around, you don't know where you're really going to settle down. You don't know who you are. Like the question, where are you from, just gets me. Because where are you from? Like I could just start, you know, I grew up in Chandigarh and then I moved here, blah, blah, blah. So for me, to really stay close to my roots was, and the one way to do that was to actually discover my love for Gurbani. Um, like the speaker was mentioning earlier, Gurbani was something that was just very intimidating for me. I was not able to relate to it. I was not able to um, make it my own. I was able to listen to Kirtan and understand it and thankfully understand more than most people can, but I was not able to make it mine because it was this really intimidating thing that I could not approach, I could not be friends with. So for me, when something was so difficult to make sense of, it just made sense for me to sit down and start writing it. And that's where my journey with calligraphy began. So he, this is one example of how I approach calligraphy. And another way I like to incorporate calligraphy into my work is by you know, just coming up with these really visually striking ways of displaying the meaning of a thought. So for example, if a verse is talking about a lotus, I would like to display the quality of the lotus that is being discussed in that pangti or tuk and display it with a visual meaning, sometimes with biomorphic representation of the um, Gurbani and producing works that, you know, if, if someone can't relate to the Gurbani, I want them to be able to relate to something, maybe the imagery behind it, and then eventually they'll dig deeper into it because that's how it worked for me. Uh, if, you know, peacocks were one of my favorite animals, the peacock piece was done first um, because I wanted to just relate to, you know, what did the Gurbani say about the peacock? What was so important about it in the Gurbani? And as I've, you know, done this, own re done this research and investigated this further, um, now I'm coming out with a collection that's called Flora of Gurbani, just talking about how different plant forms are discussed in Bani and then how I'm displaying them. So that's the collection that's coming out now. And before I end, what I would like to say is that this, this journey with you know, learning about older Sikh art forms and kind of producing contemporary themes in my art has just begun for me. So I wish, you know, this was 50, I wish I was doing this presentation even 15 years later. I probably would have even more to say. But this is just the beginning for me and I'm really, really excited to see where this goes. What's really important for me is to understand the old before I produce the new. Um, even though I think it's, it's really important for me to document and show the type of world I live in today as an artist, it's also important for me to understand the world my ancestors lived in. Which brings me to my last point is that the, these, these older Sikh miniatures exist today because there were people who commissioned them. And there were people who were producing high quality, high standard um, paintings that could be preserved, that were worthy of preserving. And today as a Sikh community, this is what we need to think about. If we want to preserve the contemporary life that we lead, uh, if we want to preserve the stories that we live and who we are today, we need to figure out whether we are going to be commissioning work that reflects our story today. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to stop with the paintings of the gurus and it doesn't have to stop with uh, the Janam Sakis. Maybe it has to do with our own you know, royal lives or normal lives we live. But I highly encourage you to think about this idea of if we're just going to be taking photos all the time of our life today, then what is going to be preserved about our experience today as a community? What about this memory together can we reflect in um, art forms? It doesn't have to be a commission you do through me. There's artists producing great amounts of work. But what you have to understand is um, if you don't commission work, artists are not going to be pushed to produce high quality work. Um, both of those things have to happen for a community to have a significant contribution in the arts. And that's my last thought for you. I thank everybody for their attention, and, and hopefully some of you were smiling in between because you look so stressed right now. <laughs> you tell. Um, and I really thank you for your time. Thank you, Jagada, for having me here. And of course, um, if somebody wants to continue following my work, 
you can visit my website. I can be found as Art by Rupi anywhere. And if somebody in case is curious about how miniature paintings are made and how calligraphy, is, Gurmukhi calligraphy is done, I have a, a workshop coming up at the Asian Art Museum on the 24th and I think the 25th as well. I think you'll really gain more from, from touching and maybe feeling and seeing how some of these materials are used. Uh, they look really, really cool. So, you know. so that's all I have for you guys. Hopefully I was on time. Bye, Jika Khalsa. Bye, Jika